In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Just in the last week, had something momentous occur. Many of us would already be aware of this, and many of us would have been there at the time that roughly this time last week, we had the joy of, of having one of our subdeacons ordained to the diaconate where you'll find him serving today. And it behooves us to then answer the question, so what's a deacon? What's the purpose of one? Why, why is it that Father Andrew's been talking about having a deacon for altogether too long? If we were to remember a sentence to answer this question, the sentence would be that a deacon is there to serve at the distribution, to take responsibilities from the priest, and that he is set aside for this purpose. Let's go through this in more detail. What, what does that mean and why is it that I, that I put this forward? You would have seen in the service last week, you would have seen a, a number of uh, physical actions and gestures that led, that led in a particular direction. They, they were matters of meaning. You would have seen him led up. Led up by two others, roughly similar rank, where the word command uttered three times. This is a call. And we may like to think of calls as something where we hear a loud voice and hopefully on the road to Damascus because that's what happened with the Apostle Paul, so that's what should happen with everyone else. And if only it was that simple. Of course, there's reasons why that's not the case, but that's, that's a long tangent. More often, this call is very perceptible because it's from the people right there. The call is from the laity, call from the clergy, the call that the deacon will then say, the third command, is the command of the bishop. If it was all about what we thought and what we thought we were worthy of and what we thought we were able to do, then no one should be ordained. This is self-evident. Who is worthy, who has won the right to serve at God's table? None. Some are called. Some are needed. And they, they utter the words of the prophet, here I am, send me. If this is what you wish, send me. And so these commands are from the people who are, who are in need and have put forward this man as a sacrifice, a willing sacrifice, a sacrifice of life. And so this man is brought forward. He's led around the altar, <coughs> venerating the corners of the altar, because it is this altar at which he will be serving, <coughs> at which he will be, uh, at which will be the context of his salvation. Led around where the number of hymns glorifying Christ, praising the martyrs, and of the fulfillment of prophecy. These are the same three hymns that we hear in the wedding service. Well, it's a similar kind of commitment that is lifelong, that is unbreakable, or ought to be unbreakable. A commitment that is that is that we expect to be to the end of one's days. In that the veneration of the altar is also receiving the blessing of the bishop. It was, after all, him who called this deacon, him who lays hands on the man to become a deacon. Then, this, the subdeacon to be ordained kneels 
on one knee. It might seem a little odd that I'm emphasizing that, but there's reason to this. See, a priest, well, someone who is to be ordained to the priesthood, will ordain on two knees what we would normally consider to be kneeling at the altar. One ordained to the diaconate on one knee because his role is twofold. He has two places of service, in the altar and in the nave, as clergy and for the people. Both of these are the context for a deacon service. We'll come back to this when we're looking at the scripture behind the diaconate. The, the next part, the bishop giving some final instructions will then ordain the man. The prayers are beautiful. They're worth reading. I think that they provide a, uh, a starting point for a role description for the deacon. We'll go through this as well. And, the, and then he's raised and he's vested. First time, others will vest him. Every other time, he'll vest himself. And it's proclaimed that he is worthy. Not be, once again, if it was because of the man, there would be no ordinations, myself included. There would be no ordinations if it was about the worthiness of the man. We proclaim him axios, we proclaim him worthy, which is what that means. We proclaim him worthy because, uh, firstly, we pray that the Holy Spirit fills what is lacking what is infirm with his power. If it's about the man, there's a problem. If it's about him being a conduit for God to work, then we have our answer. <coughs> and so at that time, we proclaim this as worthy. We proclaim that this one ought to strive to always be worthy. Think of it as being in the perfect tense. So it's not just at one particular point in time, but throughout the entirety of life, that he ought be worthy. And then he resumes, now as a deacon. When we, when we really go through the time that is set aside, we're looking at, I don't know, less than 10 minutes certainly, of the ordination occurring. It is, after all, the same community, the same liturgy, serving around the same altar as it was before, so now. Why we have a diaconate comes back to Acts, where there, was, there were great problems, there was friction in the community. You see, it's actually difficult to create a multi-ethnic community. There's difficulties that come in, multiple cultures coming together. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. It just means that there's difficulties there that need navigating. And these difficulties were raised by the, by the people in the community. You see, these Christians you know, looking out for each other, looking after each other. They didn't just have a benevolent fund. Their benevolence was everything. They didn't have their own wallet. They had the communal, uh, to, they had the community wallet to provide for everyone. And what happens then is that it's very, very difficult to make sure that everything is fair. <clears throat> what even would fair look like? Well, they were trying to navigate that. But one of the problems was that, well, without a system, you tend to go to the path of least resistance. And this came up. It says that, uh, in scripture, the Hellenists put something forward. Well, these were Gentiles. The Gentiles were um, felt neglected in the distribution of things, in, the, uh, in taking care of the needs of the community. 
And what did the apostles do? They said, we're overworked. That's why. It didn't stop there. That would be a temptation for it to stop there and say, no, we're overworked, we're overburdened, we can't fix it. No, they made an entirely new clerical order in order to make this happen. And so they chose seven men who were, um, in short, upright. They were thoroughly decent. And we'll choose them. They will look after the daily distribution. I'm sure you remember earlier in the Gospels where Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha is worried and troubled about many things. Well, someone needs to be. Someone needs to be looking after things. And you'll notice that in Jesus' response, he's not saying, Martha, you should be sitting down too. He says, Mary is doing what she needs to do. She has chosen the good part and it will not be taken away from her. Both are needed. And so the apostle said it is not right that we leave aside what is most important, that is the preaching of the word, and um, all the things that they were set aside to do as apostles, as leaders of their community, it's not right that they would set that aside to do the organizational things, to do the functional things. Why would we not have others do that? They would return to devoting themselves to teaching, to services, and so on while the deacons would make sure that the distribution was taken care of. When we look for examples of what deacons should look like, there's, well, there's many saints. There's many saints who were deacons. And I'm going to select two. I think two is firstly sufficient for us. Secondly, we see their work in scripture. The first, some have already guessed, St. Stephen. We call him the proto-martyr, being the first martyr of the Christian church. So following the, uh, following the day of Pentecost, the first recorded martyr. Now, if you're wanting to learn more about his story, then you're able to read about that. I, I forget whether it's Acts 5 or Acts 6, but read them both anyway, because Acts is a fantastic book to read. And... He's preaching the gospel. He's not just confining himself to what he was set aside to do. He's also the, um, he's also the bridge for people outside the church to come in. So both his steadfast proclamation of the truth and his willingness to preach this even at the loss of his life. Even to say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. This provides one of our, our role models for those serving in the diaconate. The second is a little later in Acts, St. Philip. Now you may know of a few Saints Philip. This one was one of the ones chosen to be a deacon, one of those original seven that the apostles made deacons. And St. Philip, he did, he did many, many things. But one I'm going to draw out. And that was when he was, um, he was called to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. The short story is that he was the one who was able to explain um, one of the passages from Isaiah that was a prophecy of Jesus Christ and how this prophecy had been fulfilled. Even more than the preaching, which we saw with St. Stephen, which we saw with, with others as well, we see him being a bridge from those on outsiders to those on the inside. And this Ethiopian eunuch was as much an outsider as we can imagine, including in Judaism. We have the we have someone who is the wrong race, who is disfigured, and he was from very far away from the temple. That's where he lived. 
And Philip saw a child of God, one for whom Christ died. Not a foreigner, not half a man, someone for whom Christ died. Between St. Stephen and Philip, we have role models for living out this distribution, for living out this go-between status. You'll see this in how our deacon serves, sometimes in the altar, sometimes out of the altar, always at the service of the whole community, always making sure that those on the out may become those within. So it's with joy that we include among our clergy one who is serving within the, role, within the rank of a deacon. And we pray that God grant him and all those who serve in this rank many, many salvific years to labor in this vineyard. Amen.